The following podcast contains spoilers and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to Animated Anarchy, the show that takes a critical look at animated features of all kinds and we determine the good from the bad. Did I do that all right or did I not? You were fine. All right, good. So yes, hello. It's been a while. It's been a while. Anyway, we're, we're, we're going to talk about another animated movie in this podcast that we have created for you. Uh, I am Andrew Dickman, and um, I am also with... <laughs> you interrupt me. Excuse right? me if I step Usually, on your line there. Uh, Mike is here. Yes. Ruaco he, is here. He is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome aboard, Mike. Thanks. How's it Glad going? to be here. How's it going? It's not like I don't see you every day from now. On. Oh yeah. Now, now that Andrew and I literally work almost back to back. Yeah, you're you're right behind me. Yeah, it's, it's, and you don't see it when you don't see me coming at you with my cane, making faces at me, and shooting like shooting of... Nerf guns at you. <laughs> At work, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's a yeah, it's, it's fun. a fun experience. It's, probably, not, it, it it's nice to be working. It's yeah, it, it does explain why we haven't been doing this for a while because uh, I've been very busy, and uh, we we've both been busy. Actually. I've been busy you, watching him be busy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we're uh, yeah we're on the same production. It's it's nice to be on the same uh, uh, production with your best friend. You know, so it's it's, it's what can really, you say? What can you say? What it is? Um. Maybe we should say it's it's well no let's not let's not say what it is because uh, I will let people just guess what it is. Okay. So uh, if they haven't been paying attention to now what you have been working on, and now that I'm and now that I'm working with you, if they haven't caught on by now, then nuts to them. So yes, we're going to talk about another animated movie this well this week well for the past couple weeks now, but anyway, it's going to be a Disney movie. Hooray! And a movie that we have actually been talking about quite a few times now. Yeah. Since, uh, uh, gosh, when? How many months ago? Like, watch this. We were at a friend's place about uh, a month ago. Yeah, a month ago. Well, we've well we have been discussing it quite a bit before yeah. we even watched it again. But um, yeah, our friend Steve hadn't seen it. I or, or was it Mike and Steve who hadn't seen it? I know, and, uh, well, Chris, too. Yeah, like, a bunch of our friends haven't oh, seen we, it. We were actually Mike, shocked. Mike and Chris were there, and then right when the movie ended, Steve came home. And right. And was like, what did you guys watch? And we're like, oh, we watched this. And he's like, oh, man, I haven't seen that movie in a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he had seen yeah. it. It was, uh, I think it was someone else who yeah. had seen it. But, yeah, um, Sword in the Stone, it's been a, a topic of discussion quite a few times in our, our career, because... Um, What's so fascinating about this movie, huh? That's just, like, it. That's just <laughs> it. Like, it's one of those weird transitional Disney movies mm-hmm. that yeah. is so... I mean, we'll discuss it more, but it's one was, of those movies for me yeah. that I grew up with as a kid and I really enjoyed. Yeah. And you realize as you get older mm-hmm. that the moments that you thought were really great yeah. might not be as great, but you still enjoy it, though? Yeah. It's a... It's a, um, a very nice uh, boy and his wizard type story. It's it's like a precursor <laughs> to Back to. The, I was saying I said it before at lunch. It's like a precursor to Back to the Future. Almost, yeah. In, a, like Marty, in a sense, yeah, Marty and Doc. Except are, except, Wart is not really as as with it. No, he's very he's, dense. <laughs> he's honestly not the focus of the movie. I mean, like he is the focus of the characters, but as the character itself like who you're really interested in is Merlin who's the is, yeah he and Archimedes are the best characters in the yeah world. And, and uh Wart is pretty much kind of left in the dust he's just Blonde kind of Mowgli yeah he is now all right trivia time because I know you're you are so much more knowledgeable and stuff like this than I am is this the first movie where they just decided to say like screw clean up let's just no, well, let's just color in our pencil drawings. Tuckily. Tech, uh, tuckily. tuckily. <laughs> what the hell? How lucky I had a mini tuckily. brain fart there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, technically, it was Dalmatians. Oh. Because they had. Cause this was before. They did, yeah, they did Sleeping Beauty in like. It took them like nine years to make Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. And it was a beautiful movie. It's still one of the most beautiful movies that Disney ever did. Yep. But the budget was so goddamn huge that it's like, yeah. 
Ooh. <laughs> And then the next movie they did was Dalmatians, which com- almost completely cut out the... The budget for this movie was big? For 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 Sleeping Beauty. Oh, for Sleeping Beauty. Not yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I was saying... Like... Yeah, and then they did uh, Dalmatians, which was a lot cheaper to make. Mm-hmm. Uh, Walt hated it in the sense that he just... He wanted things to look realistic. That's why yeah. he loved how, like, Cinderella and Snow White looked. Mm. And oh yeah, because Sleeping Beauty was a very uh, um, stylistic looking. It's stylistic, but it was cleaned up really cl- nice with colored ink lines. Yeah, and it, you know it's funny looking at it on Blu-ray. It's like it almost feels like it was digitally painted. Well, I, the, well, also the Blu-ray is also digitally altered to hell. Well, I mean, I I remember even seeing it on VHS. It's I remember it, it being very clean looking. Yeah. So it's a, it, yeah, it's a very crisp looking movie. Yeah. So. Um, and then you see Dalmatians, which is rougher, but it has the charm. It's supposed to, I mean, yeah, it's it has, it a has more style. character. It's, it's a style of more like 50s illustrations and magazines. Yeah. More than it was like. And the dogs tapestries. are caricatures as well. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's. I mean, only a few whole. years earlier they did Lay in the Tramp and those are very realistically drawn dogs. Yeah, that's true. And oh man, just how painstakingly. Uh, all the the fur little like, tufts details. of fur and detail, and and it's like I, I remember watching that one time in the theaters, and I was just watching it, and I was like, "Wow, this movie is done so beautifully." And then I watched it again at home, and then I'm looking at all the details on the fur, and I'm just thinking to myself, "Like, my God, how they had to like just the, the, the way that the the fur just stays." Imagine in between like Tramp's face, yeah, or Lady's face, or mm-hmm. the oh God forbid the the. It's like Scotty almost, dog. It's like they all almost just... counted each fur that they had to like yeah. draw out. Um, but then, yeah. But anyway, um, then you get to Dalmatians, and after that, they did Sword in the Stone, mm-hmm. which is even in comparison to Dalmatians, even though it's slightly more. That's Dalmatians. Dalmatians was really kind of the. I don't know. Not, it was. It was really a beginning point to a second, a, like a new generation of Disney movies. Yeah. In terms of their style and even how their their approach in terms of story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you get something like Sword in the Stone, which is the first movie where they really start going. Uh, they start like reusing shit a lot. That's <laughs> yeah. when you really start seeing stuff yeah. be reused to hell. Especially even sound because, effects. especially because of like you know Jungle Book afterwards right yeah jungle it's, book was after yeah and and all the the animation that they reused from uh from sword in the stone to from from you know wart to mowgli it's just yeah you know i it, it almost yeah that, that it's very strange seeing that yeah and also the thing is if you watch this movie like i forgot every time i watch this movie i forget how many times stuff is reused there are scenes in this movie that are reused Two, three, maybe even four times. Right. Scenes of Wart running, mm-hmm. Merlin making a speech, and they just change the lip sync on the mouth. Mm-hmm. And there's a part of me that's like, yeah, I, I think it would save time mm. and save money. But at the same time, doesn't it feel like you're putting in just as much effort, if not more so, trying to repurpose something old to something new, including dialogue and yeah, everything? That does seem really um, almost counterintuitive. It's like, it's like, would it take as much effort to just draw out whatever whatever the hell you wanted as opposed to planning out, you know, uh, if we need to reuse this, can we? And can we Xerox it and just paint that or, or paint over that? Yeah, it, it, I don't know what the production costs are for, for these kind of things. And... It's kind of like the whole argument was like, oh, the reason why they're doing CG is because it's cheaper. No, it's actually, not. it's not. It's actually costs more. There's a lot more. Th- <laughs> there's a lot more um, steps in the process. Yeah, yeah. Including simulation and all that stuff. And the other thing too is you have to remember that they were doing Xerox in this movie. Yeah. People think, oh, Xerox, it's easy. You just put in a photocopier, mm-hmm. and you. Fo- no, it's this was before the standard photocopy machine. Right. It was at a time where. To, to shoot Xerox, you had to stick the individual drawing on a plate of glass, <laughs> spin it upright, mm-hmm. take a, a pretty much a picture of it, and then transfer it to to celluloid. Yeah. And it was an extensive process. It's not process. like the copy machines, you know? It's 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 not like what you would see at work and be like, you know, press it down. And yeah. For, let, oh, let, that was easy. Let the 20... machine do what it does. Right. Then... This was the early stages of Xerox. Yeah. Early, yeah, early yeah, yeah, Xerox. Yeah. yeah. This is not like the Xerox today. If you ever see like old... Trust me. If you ever see like old like printing presses... 
Mm-hmm. It was practically the sa- not the same, but it was like imagine having to write out something and having to put everything into a printing press and then stamp it down <laughs> and having to replace everything and do it yeah. over again. It's the same. It's like very tedious work. Yeah, it is. Uh, I assume that was someone's job. Oh yeah, on these I'm, movies, was just going in and okay, I got to scan these drawings today. This is God. Fun. Imagine if all the animators had to do that themselves. It's like you nowadays know, well, they practically g- can. Well, yeah, I mean now, but I mean then, it's just oh. like <laughs> yeah, it's like hey, look, if you got to reuse this animation, you're gonna have to do it yourself. Here's how you do it. So uh, blah 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 blah. All right, bye. And got and they had to make sure, to, you know, God forbid, there was even a loose pencil line in a random part of the sheet of paper. Oh yeah, because then that would transfer over. Yeah, and you can't even bend the paper or something, right? Because it's because a crease would probably also. I don't know. Make I mean, a, I think they shoot line. it on. I think they would shoot it on really high contrast film, so it only take the blackest of the black. Probably, yeah, nah, most likely. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, given the the style of the whole movie, um, I love that look. Honestly. I really I, do. I, I love. That's why I like like the new Winnie the Pooh movie. Mm-hmm. Even it was still maybe just a little too clean. Mm, yeah, but like I, something I like it. Paper Man. It's like I think they wanted to get that sort of style going, but at the same time, it's like eh, it's still a little clean. We got to boom vector we, line. We got to close. We got to close the lines in order for the paint fill to yeah. <laughs> fully take effect. But like. I really do like that sketchy style. So whenever I see something that's animated in that kind of pencil test that's just colored kind of yeah. look, I love it. Yeah, some of my favorite movies are, are done in that look. It's, you know, The Rescuers. Uh, um, Jungle Book. Well, Jungle Book. Winnie the, the original Winnie the Pooh shorts, Yeah, for Winnie sure. the Pooh, 101 Dalmatians. Yeah, um, 101 Dalmatians is what started that, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, it, yeah, I, I mean... The look of it is fantastic. Oh, and I know why we keep discussing it. It's because uh, I I have the Blu-ray of Sword oh, in the Stone. Oh, God. And um, I didn't realize at the time, but then you mentioned it. And it was it like, puts tears in my eyes yeah, watching and, it. And this is why I kept the original DVD that I had. Because the, the thing that was about my collection is that... I had all of the Disney movies on DVD at one point. And then when they came out on Blu-ray, I was like, like okay. Oh, shit. <laughs> Actually, that's a, that would be a nice step up because it comes with the DVD and the Blu-ray. And, it's like, and while logically that shouldn't really be a problem, it's like, it's, to me, I think that I won't mind having it on DVD and Blu-ray. But here's the problem. A lot of those movies that had that sketchy look to it have been digitally destroyed like like they they have they they just took the facet filter on all of these cells and just made it blend so that all of the details of the sketchiness just blurs into itself into a solid and this happened to the the droopy cartoon uh dvd that, well, that uh, one Warner they Brothers had something called out. DNVR, which was a di- which is a dirt was, which was yes. a dirt removal yes. program. Which and I almost feel dirt. that's what they did with this. Uh, this one, it looks like they went over it and they just smudged the line, yeah. where it just looks like. Well, the problem is it's it's done in. But a pa- that's not DNR or DVNR, DVNR, or, or DNVR, Diviner, <laughs> Diviner, dirt no, digital noise reduction or something like that. Either way, it they they took it and. For HD, because like Disney went through a stage, there was a stage where Disney's like, well, we're only going to release this pan and scan version and widescreen version. You can get one or the other. And then they yeah. finally said, okay, everyone has HD. We're going to just stick to widescreen. Right. Then there was a time when Disney was making, when everything was HD and they were releasing all their old movies. They were like, oh, um, people are complaining that there's black bars on the sides of their screen. Mm-hmm. So they would zoom in and chop the top and bottom off. Yep. Um. And try to or stretch the image to fit to widescreen, yeah. or what they would do like on the Pinocchio DVD is that they would since it was four by three, there were these big black bars on the side. They would have someone paint like borders, so when you watch the movie, there's a border, mm. which looks absolutely stupid and distracting. Yeah. And then they went through a time where okay, these movies are being transferred to HD on <laughs> HD TVs. The sketchy look. We want people love to see clean, beautiful lines. Yeah. Let's go back into our movies and and make it more aesthetically pleasing, and but in turn them, ruining the movie. Yeah, and and all the time uh, while they were advertising the suicide, once they're out, w- once this is sold out, it'll never be out again. Bullshit. And it's going right back into the vault. 
and they have like an animation of a vault shutting and yeah it's... but the thing about like with with sword and stone and like some of the other movies i think they did it to some degree on uh, jungle they did it to jungle book for sure yeah um the, these restoration teams mm. there's an there's obviously an a b and c team yeah. like the restoration on snow white beautiful looks mm. great bambi fantastic yeah, then you because, get like because honestly, compared to like Sword in the Stone, Bambi and Snow White and Pinocchio, well, to lesser extent Pinocchio, it's like those are more notable films, and I think that their logic is is like, oh, the reason th- these are lesser important Disney movies, so who will care? Yeah, and uh, they just bring them onto this B team, as you say, and uh, they just. They 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 just like sit back and watch the computer. It feels like they ran it, ran it through. Them. It looks like they ran it through a program, went out to get lunch, and then said, "Oh, the file's done. Let's pr- let's burn it to the, let's print it on the DVDs." Yeah, it just looks lazy. Yeah, it looks it either looks lazy or God forbid, it just looks like someone was like, "We we want you to go in and just you, digitally ruin these." You movies. really notice it when there's character close ups. Oh um, God! Especially the big w- scene is there's a scene. If you look on YouTube, there's a video on YouTube of a comparison between the DVD from like. 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. And the new That's a DVD, DVD that I have. And um, there's a scene in the movie where Archimedes is teaching Wart how to spell mm-hmm. and teach him the ABCs, and he's drawing on a chalkboard. Yeah. Chalk looks very, very specific with little, like, you know... It's textured. It's, it's textured. It's, yeah. In the movie, they smeared the line. So it looks <laughs> like he's sm- smudging, like, white bird poop yeah. on a... Or paint. That's probably the cleanest thing to say. <laughs> it looks like he's smudging white paint onto a blackboard. It looks absolutely. It's yeah. Horrific. It's it didn't really bother me at first until but, I said something. But but on, yeah, well that too. But but at the same time, it's like I probably wouldn't have noticed at, that much because I'm I'm not really that nitpicky when it comes to watching movies on Blu-ray or DVD. It's like I'm I'm mostly I don't mind if a movie's on DVD. It's like it, it things look about the same quality to me no matter what. Right. Um, Especially for an animated movie, which all you can do is make stuff sharper. Yeah. Which doesn't mean it's better. But um, I do like historical restoration, and I like to see um, things the way they're meant to be seen. So Blu-ray kind of helps that, in a sense. Yeah. Where where it's like you get to see all those details. And... Um, yeah, when we when we looked that up and we did the comparison for ourselves, and I saw you go, I was like, oh, 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 god, oh, oh. You, you were, yeah, I was, I you were like, happy. you were writhing in pain while this was going on, and I was looking at it, and I was like, huh, and then I went to go see the DVD, and I was like, oh my god, you're right. Yeah, and the thing is, it's it's sad. Like, there's people who, if you watch something like Snow White, mm. that movie. Every time it comes out, it's beautiful restorations. They get ruined every time. Yeah. The colors on that movie aren't candy shop colors. It's all it was originally all subdued browns and sepia tones. That's true, yeah. More like a children's book, very yeah. very in the gray area. Now well, they well, they up the contrast and they up the color saturation. Well, the thing is is that um film, I mean, film over time gets destroyed no matter what. There there was actually mentioned that um there are almost thousands, thousands upon hundreds of thousands of films that are just, they can't be fixed. They can't be restored because they have reached that limit to where the film is no longer manageable yeah. to to enhance. Yeah. Because they've either been, uh, you know, uh, stored somewhere really terribly or, or they've, they no one really took notice of them because these films don't have that, notoriety that certain other films have like um gone with the wind you know for certain that the movie's never out of print no it's never out of print because they keep restoring it and they they it's a notable movie it is a historically well-known movie however there's other movies with um some that i can't think up off the top of my head um I, most b movies from like the yeah 40s like and 50s. b movies and stuff like that it was like while there is a small niche market that will appreciate stuff like that. I think it's a shame that studios and companies do not take into do not take their value for what they are. Yeah, this is still film, and it's still this is listen. All this is just the truth of life. Everything that you make right now in a hundred years 
no one's going to care about it. Right. That's just the truth of it. I mean, there's I, a few. There's exceptions. All, yeah. Well, of course, there's but. exceptions. I mean, but but for for the most of it, like a lot of take for example, a lot of the cartoons that we saw on Saturday morning. Probably in a hundred years, unless some super special vault studio decides to keep historical value out of it will it will probably disappear within time like 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 jason and the wheeled warriors or whatever it is it's like the us i remember that movie because i grew up with it however the next generation or probably the generation after that will probably not give a shit about it because they did not grow up with it or there is no notoriety over it and there's some so. shows that, that are culturally <laughs> significant like say in our field mm. A Disney show like DuckTales yeah. and Darkwing Duck, right. those are big, big, big shows that are like cultural tent poles. Yeah. And then you see a show like, like Quack Pack or Mighty Ducks, <laughs> or even to a extent Tailspin. Yeah. Those will probably be forgotten in 100 years. Probably. Jungle Cubs, yeah, those will be gone. Oh, God, Jungle Cubs. I see. I didn't even remember that until you mentioned it. Yeah, like even the Wuzzles. Like who here has a DVD copy of the Wuzzles? <gasps> but the I, Wuzzles. I, I, I wanted to say also... <laughs> <laughs> Even if a movie's remembered, that doesn't mean it's it's saved. No. It, it, the, the problem is we live in an age where there's people like... Like, remember when there was a time where Ted Turner wanted to colorize everything? Yeah. Because he thought it looked nice? Right. That's one guy's opinion and maybe yeah. a small group of people's opinion. Yeah. That's... That's not the right way. And that's a lot of times on these Disney movies. Yeah, because like a lot of cartoons, um, I remember on Nickelodeon back back in the, back in the day, um, before Nick at Night would start, they, they had like these old black and white uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. And they had to restore them somehow. And they would and color I, them. And I, get, I don't know where the hell they had them restored, but it's like they there were frames missing. Yeah, watch, yeah, watch a They're, Popeye cartoon that's been recolored. Oh, shit. They're colored overseas. They're literally painting on the individual frames. Yeah. It's absolutely horrifying. It is. It's and it's very scary. I had a discussion with someone Can who apparently again? works worked at one point on restoration. And I saw one of the Blu-ray Disney releases. And I'm like, what did you guys... It was Sleeping Beauty. Mm. I said, what did you guys do? <laughs> like, why are the fairies like look like they're made out of like caramel apples? They just look like bright candy colors. That's not the colors they use. Like, oh, we referenced the cells. Mm. And I'm like, you're an idiot. You never reference the cells. Mm. And they were like, why? It's like, because the thing about a cell and about how photography was done back then yeah. is that something that you see under a camera, especially at th like three strip Technicolor, which is a very volatile process at the time. Yeah. To get one color on the screen, you had to paint a completely different color. That's why they had a color system. Mm. So like in the case of like Dalmatians, if you painted those Dalmatians white on the cells, they would shine like glowing stalag. They would glow yeah. under the camera because they were too bright, and the light would reflect on them and cause a blur. Yeah. So they had to paint them gray in order for them to come out as white. And on that's film. why that's why a lot of them are gray when right. you watch it. Certain it's cells, you look at scare like cells of Jiminy Cricket, his skin color is a completely different color than what ends up on the screen mm -hmm. because how it's going to be interpreted by the the the, the, the Technicolor process when it goes yeah. from shooting under the camera to being printed onto film. Yeah, and it's also why it's like a lot of these, um, you know, the, the, these, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is it called? These royalty-free <laughs> hundred, like, thousand cartoons in one collection. All those public domain collections. Yeah, the public domain. That's what I'm looking for. 50 famous it's cartoons, like, yeah. yeah. Some of them are very pink-looking, and it reminds me of like even back when I was growing up in like uh, preschool, we would watch films like like on a projector uh, machine, and uh, watching those films, it was like it would always be pink, and that is just the the age that's just the look. age of the film, and you know, looking at that, it's like oh god, it it it, it is disheartening. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, you almost want to kind of see it in another light, yeah. and, and but like you were said, you know, with you know Ted Turner says like, oh, we got these cartoons and let's recolor them. Yeah, ever hear the famous line? I think it was one of the last things that Orson Welles ever said. Mm -hmm. um, he was he. I think one of the last things he said was, "Keep Ted Turner away from my films with his fucking crayons." <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. It was really funny. Yeah. We just spent the last 15 minutes talking about film restoration and not yeah, wasn't about the Wasn't this movie. about Sword in the Stone? It was. Yeah. Sorry, well, folks. Well, yeah, but I mean, I mean, you know, it's an, it's an important discussion, so, honestly, because uh, historical restoration is a process and it is important for, you know, films to be historically... Uh, 
presented presented yeah and it's like I, and i don't want to say accurate because um everybody and, who worked on it at the time is dead so yeah, you can't it, compare it in, in a sense it's like it would be difficult to do sometimes so you know yeah. what can you do right <laughs> what can you do but, um but, back to the subject at hand yeah but but sword in the stone i mean that's a travesty that, oh. that could have been avoided so if you that, guys after listening to this or before listening to this if you want to watch the movie mm-hmm. don't watch the recent it came out like a year two years yeah, ago don't watch the blu-ray, blu-ray release or is. even the dvd because it's it's the same movie has just, there even been any complaints like has there been any address over that like, like they have but the thing is they disney has made their money they don't no, give they a don't, shit they don't care so, so like yeah. if you're gonna watch it find a copy from like one of the dvds you can find it on ebay for yeah, like early ten bucks, 2000. early two thousands. I think it came out even in the late nineties. Yeah, find that one. It might be a little bit. Uh, there might be some dust on the film and and some camera shake and stuff like that. Yeah, but it's that's... a lot better than watching a movie be completely smeared with like yeah, exactly, like a shit covered hand, like a, <laughs> like a monkey. <laughs> All right. So anyway, the yeah. movie itself, though, Sword in the Stone. All right, let's uh, let's begin talking about this movie that we were going to discuss. Yeah. Um. So we start off with a very nice little. Uh, a lullaby. legend is sung and, uh, of when England was young, yeah, it, whose it, nights it, were brave and bold. And the good <laughs> king had died, <laughs> and no one could decide. Yeah, it's a very beautiful song that uh, talks about the, basically the the introduction to the world that we're at, and it's um. Gosh. Who is rightful heir to the throne? Okay, I'm done. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're almost done. No, no, I went. I'm halfway through the song. I can't sing anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, but it... it seemed <laughs> that the land would be torn by war. I don't actually remember the other ly- the lyrics to the other right. part of the song. I don't either. So, so yeah, but uh, it, it's. Honestly, um, compared to a lot of the other Disney movies, it's it's a nice way to open up the movie. Well, it's the traditional open up a book. Yeah, you know, but but I mean, like, it, it's not like opening a book and then there's a narrative that's like a long time ago. It's not like a, like Merlin, uh, like Archimedes is in a. Oh, what are you doing? Yeah, well, I, mean, I guess I'll tell you the story. Yeah. Open to book or Wart is like, this is me. <laughs> this is me. No, that's look not at me. that. Look at that scrawny guy. They kind of do it in a weird way, where oh yeah, 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 um, where it, the movie begins well, with the narration. Well, we get the narration at the beginning, it's sung to us in song. Um, you know, for, from a nice minstrel. You know, a bard is singing us. Yeah, some some us. so a faceless bard is is just like in front of the in book. front of the campfire and just going like, and this is what happened. And all right, you're on your own. <laughs> and then he sings the last bit, and then. Sebastian Cabot is the narrator and he takes over mm-hmm. and he says that since no one has found no one has pulled the sword out of the stone no one is king of England yeah and it's dark it's a, time this is a dark age yeah. without law without order <laughs> <laughs> with a strong play upon the weak and so then you see Merlin yeah which is out. a great introduction to this yeah he's just like and it's like this is a dark age and then you just see him Dark age indeed. No plumbing. It's, it's almost like he heard the narrator. Yeah, really. he's like, yeah, dark age indeed, you asshole. Yes. Look at me having to pull water out of a well. I don't see you helping me out. <laughs> I'm just going to stay out of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, until the end of the movie. But he's he's basically just pulling water out of a well, yeah. and he's like this old complainer. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is, it's a great little establishing like who this character is. Like he's He's... A kind of a sometimes he's very commudgeony, yeah. But then once he gets inside the house and makes his tea, he kind of just settles down, yeah. And you have a great little moment where you introduce really him and Archimedes, his his pet owl, yeah, the highly educated owl. <laughs> I remember what every what, educated I, owl. I would I would <laughs> I would scream that at <laughs> times. I would just <laughs> random moments. I'd be in the middle of a restaurant and you just hear educated owl. <laughs> no, that's not true, but. And always that I, I remember seeing someone made a video where they took that and they <laughs> raised pay, the like, volume and yeah. they and they expanded it to, to be like fifteen seconds long. <laughs> and just it was terrible. Yeah. Anyway. And it's I, you have a great little introduction where he's making tea and mm-hmm. um Merlin is anticipating that 
someone is coming. And then it's a great little way to introduce, like, oh, someone's coming. Who is it? Well, I'll mm-hmm. tell you who it is. I know who it is. Yeah. It's a boy that's, I don't really know who he is, but I can yeah, guess. Yeah, it's it kind of like. Uh, and it shows the extent of his magic and his ability, too, because he's like, I know someone's coming. Yeah, because at, predict- at first you just find this guy as, like, a, a doddering old, you know, ranting old man in the middle of the forest and he's not he doesn't really seem intelligent but dressed in his night clothes and and his <laughs> and the place that he lives in his shack is like going to pieces and it's just completely a mess yeah he has books all over the place no, not even on shelves yeah. they're just like it's all my favorite on set in the movie yeah it's really, I actually it's really, really like that set that that whole background like how they treated that hut yeah so, uh, but yeah, he talks about uh, the the boy that is going to a- eventually show up, and we're introduced to him, and he's like, he's a boy, uh, about uh, twelve or so on, and that oh oh no no that's definitely not him <laughs> yeah. because we see another character K, Sir, who, uh, yeah Sir K, yeah, and he I love this character. He's a caricature of Milk Call who animated him with the. <laughs> With like the the the, the lip he, is curled up. He is basically nothing but chin. I mean, I, <laughs> and and he has like his lips all the way up right to his nose. Where he's just, when he opens his it, mouth, his mouth like his jaw goes down about a good two or three feet. He yeah. Quiet what? <laughs> yeah. If if you he's like the 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 precursor to Don Bluth. He just looks like a Don Bluth animation. character. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I and I just he looks love like it belong- he, he looks like Dirk the Daring. Kind of, yeah, he kind of does. He looks kind of like Dirk. When Dirk like gets hit and he like his scrunches his face. Yeah, and he looks like K. Yeah, only he has like hair. He's like, and it's funny because like this what this movie came out in like the late sixty three, sixty three. Yeah, so it's like he almost kind of looks like a scraggly haired, you know, seventies uh, sort of uh, hippie kind of guy. Yeah. but you know the the jockish type, you know, sort. Of, so yeah. it's it's kind of funny seeing him. I was like, I I it, he would be a caricature of that '70s show almost. Yeah, <laughs> very very pr- like a proto Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but with a jaw about the yeah. size of a small dagger. And he's followed by Wart, who is Arthur, who is like uh, a yeah. Do it? Do they even say that in the beginning? He's, he says my name's Arthur, but everyone calls me Wart. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I almost thought that would have been a neat reveal that he is Arthur. That his name was Arthur, like in the end, like if he just said like in the beginning, it's like oh my name is Wart. Well, the thing is they or, like, established the movie. They established in the beginning of the movie that we can't find someone to pull out this sword and the stone. But, it, but and I, then you know that by the end of the movie, that fucking boy. I and mean, even the posters, if you want, look at the old posters <laughs> for the movie. Yeah. It's so, It's Wart pulling the sword out of the stone. Yeah, with Merlin watching this gleefully. Is, yeah, it, it's it's like the Planet of the Apes poster, where it's like the ending is revealed before you even. Oh, watch it's like it. oh so fuck like, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if they if they had like a little bit more planning in that sort of concept, yeah, maybe it would have been neat if like if they just said it was name is Wart, and at the end. But then again, it's like not a lot, whole lot of people really. I, I guess not really. Uh, I mean. Now, I think we're a little bit more knowledgeable about the tale of King Arthur and his yeah. knights. Um, uh, mostly due because of the Monty Python movie. Yeah, with, with Holy Grail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, maybe maybe then it was just like, oh, this is the story of Arthur. You already know how it is. Yeah. Here, here, here's, here's, here's how the, he got to be king. Yeah, here's the tale before, like the origin story. Here's the origin here's the or- of yeah, Arthur. Yeah, the proto-origin story <laughs> movie. Yeah. And so... Uh, and you know, Kay tries to kill Bambi's mom. That's right. It's that's the same. The, anim- that's more reused first, animation. First reused animation is Bambi's mom. It's probably the first time that Bambi's mom was ever reused in a Disney movie. <laughs> before, after Bambi, she's not dead, and she's in a million movies after. Yeah, she's in Rescuer. She's in Beauty and the Beast. For God's sake, she's she in is. the first shot of Beauty and the Beast. Mm-hmm. And um, so Wart screws him up, mm-hmm. and he makes his signature. Yell, which would whoa, be whoa, what, whoa, whoa, what, whoa, <laughs> which is you hear it that like is, eight or nine times in this fucking yeah, did movie. We, did we make a count as to how many when we, times when we watch the movie? Every time we do it, I would just go four. <laughs> yeah. Five minutes later, he does it again. Five. <laughs> whoa, what? Whoa, whoa. That, that's sex. <laughs> that that almost <laughs> needs to be like a Wilhelm scream for for certain. It's like the things. it's that and the goofy holler. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um. 
So yeah, he he screws up. He has up to go back and find his his uh, K's arrow. arrow. So and then there's and then there's a character that's introduced who you see twice. I guess they liked him enough in the beginning that they put him in halfway through later. Mm-hmm. Is this very wily coyote esque looking scraggly oh, wolf? Oh yeah, yeah. Who's a fun character? He's a great like, and he, I love the sounds he makes. He's and, basically to add to the scenery while. Well, add a sense of danger talking. to this dark wood. Yeah, but but later on, he's like he's more you know comic relief. He's a comedic while foil. Are talking. Yeah, yeah, he's probably the most comedic villain of the movie. <laughs> if you can consider him a villain, that's another thing. This is a this is one of those movies that doesn't really follow a. a well, well, we'll discuss this later. Yeah. On, but but um, yeah. So, uh, Wart finds the arrow. It's high up on a tree. He reaches for it, and then he falls through the hole that. Uh, you know, through he Merlin's falls into hut. Merlin's house and lands exactly where Merlin thought he'd land, yeah. in, in the chair on the opposite side of his table. Yeah. And then you have this great little introduction where they introduce each other, and mm-hmm. Merlin is a soothsayer, and yeah. and he says, "I'm a, you know, I'm from the future." I am a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> and he does this. I mean, it's and like then he's they, trying to be like yeah. spectacular, but he. Yeah, there's a great little moment where it just seems like an old man that is crazy. Yeah, there's and, a scene. There's a scene in this, and if. Uh, where and this is an animation thing that always bugged me because mm. Mill Call was like the supervising animator and he designed all the characters in this movie. Yeah, he's, he's a, a great great animator. Cartoon. Hammy as hell. Yeah, because there's a scene in the movie that always bugged me, even as a kid, where there's a scene where um, uh, Merlin shows. Wart a a steam locomotive. He pours some tea, yeah. and it goes on. And he's introducing it, and then there's a moment where he goes, "And that won't be invented for hundreds of years." Oh yeah, when and he, he puts his hands his up in the air, well, and I'm like, "Who the hell does that?" <laughs> Nobody does this like weird like hundreds of years. It looks like he was about to scare someone out of a closet. <laughs> like they should. <laughs> with his hands above him. It looks really stupid. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of really weird little eccentric like, anim- little animated animation bits. things like um, you know, eye squintings, um uh, a uh, lot of head swaggling. Yeah, oh yeah. A lot of head shaking. Um, but uh, I think that adds to the whole style stylistic approach to the yeah. characters. I mean, stuff like that is like you would never see that in in like human acting. But for a cartoon, it's it's more acceptable. And since the characters are so caricatured, mm. and many of the animators who worked on it said that, like the humans that they did in that movie, like specifically Sir Ector, mm. is one of the best human characters they ever did. Because yeah. it was he was human, he felt grounded, but the fact that he was stylized, it gave him a lot of free reign to kind of pull and push and and and, and that the yeah and um that's what i really like about this a movie itself so we'll we'll continue on with that um but yeah this is where merlin finally reveals his magical powers and, and he's a, he's going to move in with wart at his yeah and he says castle. I'm gonna, and he and he pretty much shoves himself like saying i'm going to be your tutor and i'm going to teach you all about yeah, all this stuff yeah he's <laughs> and he's like oh i didn't ask for this it's like you crazy yeah, weird wart, old man wart just like accepts it he doesn't really he doesn't really question it, you know? It's not like... I mean, I mean, the closest thing that he does is like, oh, I have to go back home, and I'm going to be a squire, and I'm... Uh, and Merlin is just like, you're, you're going to be bigger than that, yeah. so I'm, so let's go. That's uh, a great impression, by the way. <laughs> He's like, oh, we're going to be bigger than this. Powerpuff Girls! Yeah. There's a giant cookie destroying the city. Oh, my pickle! <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, like... I love this. I love moments where a character starts to say something and then realizes what he's saying and stops himself. There's a scene where, like, so what do you want to be when you grow up? And he's like, well, I'm, I want to be a squire and I'll learn about swordsmanship and all stuff. And he's like, yes, that's very, that's very good, son. That's a, no, no, that's not right at all. And he's, <laughs> yeah. I love this. Like a little great little moment yeah. where the char- there's a bit of like the cl- the cl- wheels turning in someone's head. One of my favorite moments in that entire scene is when uh, the 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 cup that is dishing out the sugar yeah. for for his tea. It like he continues on and before he's like say when boy when and then he goes on to Merlin's cup. He keeps going and Merlin's just talking. Yeah. It's like yes and uh, when when does it all when <laughs> when <laughs> when he sounds like a Popeye character. Yeah. <laughs> It's I lo- great. And I love it because it's like it, it shows so much character in, in It shows that he's a, a warm character and he really means well, but then when things then go the moments. wrong way, he just gets fucking livid. Yeah, he and he gets angry quite a bit in this. Well, he, he flip-flops. He's he's very mm-hmm. he's, he's very his 
he flips his emotions on a dime. Yeah. I mean, it's make what makes him charming, and he's I love him because he reminds me of like every grandfather, mm. like grandfather in that kind of range. Like the you know the my grandfather was very similar to Merlin. Would there be times where he'd be very quiet, like now boy, <laughs> you know? But, and, Gosh, d- yeah, damn yeah, it! But, you know, if like, he, but if he if he like explains something to you. And into like in a very calm tone, and he's just like, "All right, do you understand?" And then you shake your head, and he's like, w- "When you get to the point where it, you know, it's like it, it, it's like the first time you don't get it. Second time, I'm gonna make sure that you get this because I'm not saying it a third time." Yeah. And the <laughs> thing is, even even like Merlin is so doddering that even he gets kind of confused by what he says. <laughs> So it's 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 and really it, fun. And it's great that he has a sidekick like Archimedes because Archimedes is an angry bird. That, it, that is, the original Angry Bird. Yes, the original <laughs> Angry Bird. Oh, I hate T-shirts that say that with Donald. You go to Disneyland, you oh, see God, T-shirts yes. with Donald Duck on it. Says the original Angry Bird. It's like fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, Disney <laughs> consumer <laughs> products. <laughs> and they're they're gonna regret yeah. that once. But the Archimedes is a great like he is sort of a, he's stubborn like Merlin. He's very much like Merlin, but he's almost. Um, a little less senile. Yeah, it's it's like he's the <laughs> it's like he's the friend that is about 20, 30 years younger than the old man that he's, you know, hanging around with. Yeah. And just kind of like he's just just had it with Mermaid his crap. Man and Barnacle Boy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's like it's coot. like Merlin is Batman or Adam West and uh Archimedes is Robin. Yeah. But if Robin was just like I'm sick and tired of your shit Batman. <laughs> yeah. It's like can I can I please have my own house? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Merlin ends up um does doing a little song, a little Sherman Brothers song. Mm-hmm. And by Sherman Brothers song I mean that it's a whimsical song with made up words in it. Yeah. Like every one of those. Flippity floppity floop. <laughs> That's that's <laughs> wickety wackety whack. Yeah. Leap up, leap up, leap up. <laughs> it's, it's very yeah. much so. Da-da-da-da-da. But he, he he packs up his entire hut uh, into a bag, like yeah. Felix the Cat's magic yeah, that, bag that's, of tricks. Yeah. And the bag. The, yeah, and uh, so they go off, and then they go to. Wart's castle, where he lives, which is really interesting. You would think like. This is a home in, in this world where where it's. I, I'm kind of curious. Is this the castle where the king has died, and they just no? Decide- there's many castles. There's different people who own. So like, I just imagine that Ect- Sir Ector, that's his domain, that's his castle, and then people across England. There wasn't that many populated cities. It wasn't as populated <laughs> as it was today. Yeah, but he doesn't live in a village, like in a village or anything. It's like maybe well, people did live by themselves, and then they lived inside of a castle, mm. and then they. But the thing is about that movie that bugs me is that there's Ector. Yeah. It's a very dilapidated castle, by the way. Right. There's Ector, K. Wart, and then like one scullery maid. That's the only people you see in this castle. Yeah, there are. Who's whole... cooking? Who's cleaning? You who's don't ki- really see a whole lot of characters until the end. Um, where where it turns into the the uh, the jousting uh, tournament. Yeah, they go to ta- they go to England, which yeah. is you know a big. And and the the reason why I say it's like okay, they live in a castle. It's like they're they're by themselves. That kind of isolates the whole the 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 whole story, in which if you had a village and they were lived in cottages or even like maybe in, a, in another cottage, like like just beyond the past. You know how most of these stories kind of start off they're in a cottage somewhere else outside of the village and they they work farm work but if they were in a village it's like they probably would have had to do more characters and they just yeah. didn't really want to do that well, you limit yourself i mean the character count in this movie is actually fairly low until yeah. you get to the end yeah, of the yeah. Movie. so and, and even then they're not that animated right exactly yeah. so like they get to this castle and you introduce to ector who's the caretaker and he's he's a responsible because um wart was adopted mm. um Oh, and, adopted. He's Harry Potter. Yeah, like, pretty much. <laughs> and so Ector takes care of him, and you could tell that he is a caring. Mm-hmm. He's a he's a boisterous kind of angry guy. Yeah, it's like but, it's not but like he a doesn't point have the, heart. But, but in the beginning, he was up. He's up. He's clearly up. It makes him a little more likable. Is that he honestly is worried mm-hmm. where Ward has gone, and he's yeah. like, "I'm responsible," and I'm you know, and Kay is just like. Look, Dad, and he's eating this. He eats, I'm not my Ward's keeper. Yeah, and he's just and he's eating like. He, he, ate, he eats like five turkey legs in that scene. <laughs> it's the same animation too. He does like ever see in my cousin so in my cousin legs. in my cousin Vinny 
There's the one guy in the bar who just eats an entire chicken leg in one <laughs> scoop. He just goes and like yeah. c- completely takes the meat off the bone yeah. in one go. And they and they have like you know dogs, like, yeah, like uh, castle dogs that big castle which you never see again. Yeah, and you know it's like they're. I mean, what's nice is that they're treated as like your regular dogs. It's like at first they're vicious and they're fighting over a bone, but then as soon as Wart comes in, they just like run up to him and start licking. They him. like him. Yeah, it's it's like. It's it's a cute little way to kind of give a nod of that that Wart is a sweet person and the dogs like him. Yeah, and that K is merely a meal ticket. You know, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and so they go in, and uh, Wart sent off because he's late and he has demerits. So he has to four demerits, and he has to go down and clean in the kitchen. Yeah. And so then you have this great little back and forth between Merlin, Merlin and Ector. And, yeah. He proves to, that he's magic, and and, uh, <laughs> and that's where we get the educated owl. <laughs> get a, you put a little bit of Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> well, he has that sort of like throat, you know, Throaty, warbles. Yeah, like, and that's Sebastian <laughs> Cabot as well, who's also the narrator. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. I think right. it's his first. It's his first role for Disney, but he did like later did like Bagheera. That's true. And the narrator in Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was pretty prominent at that time. I remember him mostly from those, but also in there's a Twilight Zone episode where he plays um like a, like an angel for this guy who was killed mm. he's like would you like anything and he's and it just sounds like bagheera <laughs> and he's this big fat like warm like jolly looking british oh, man yeah yeah so <laughs> and so merlin convinces him using magic that he is magic uh, you don't have any of that uh, dark magic, dark magic black dude. magic black oh never magic. touch the stuff <laughs> yeah. oh no never touch the stuff yeah, yeah. but um <laughs> Ector gives him, he's like, I get, I'm going to give you the best room in the house. And it's the room at the tallest tower. And it's the, the most dilapidated piece of he's shit. He's basically the asshole landlord that yeah. kind of sticks you into the, the low. Like, he tries to sell you the, the room. And it's like, oh, it's great. It's got lots of. Uh, it's the best room in the house. Yeah, the you best know? room in the house. There's lots of uh, air conditioning. <laughs> it's a nice cross breeze. Yeah. Great view of the southern. Yeah, English countryside. And it's it's about to fall over. Oh yeah, it's, there there's a part moments. of the there's a part of the tower where you look at it and it's like, is that just the one wooden beam holding up <laughs> the the top half of this tower? There's even moments like the next morning, um, Kay is le- is training for his jousting thing, and uh, he <laughs> he like falls and hits the wall, and, and it, then it tumbles. Yeah, it, like it, it it makes the whole thing rock. This thing is just rocking, and Merlin's just like looking out the window, like oh. <laughs> What's going on down there? <laughs> there's an, or, and before that, it's raining and there's holes in the roof. And then he sends Archimedes to find out what's going on because a character named Sir Pelinor, who's this big... Pelinor! <laughs> he, with this big nosed um, yeah. guy who comes in. He's and a big He brings nose. news from London. And the great thing is I love this one scene where he co- he's at the door. I bring news, news from, from London! London! And he, like, he, whoever animated him, like... For one frame, makes his mustache go his out. His eyes go his crazy. His eyes go crazy it's, for one. It's, London! It's a great little animation yeah. piece. So he goes inside and lets Hector know that um, they're doing a tournament on, on New Year's Day, which yeah. was, I guess it's the summertime, so they got some time to prepare. But they have that, that whoever, um, they're going to do it, instead of waiting for whoever pulls the sword out of the stone, they're going to have a tournament to yeah. see who, and whoever wins the tournament will become king of England. Yeah, this basically makes the whole concept of the sword and the stone kind of like, uh, it, it makes it a little bit more of like a, a race against time sort of thing. Yeah, well, and, yeah. Well, and, and, yeah. And, and, like, it raises the stakes a little bit. Yeah. But in not a way... Not in a way that makes it seem very important. <laughs> yeah, because it's it doesn't really. It gets forgotten. It's forgotten. Yeah, it's forgotten a lot. Yeah, I mean, there's moments where like where Hector will say, "All right, Kay, we can get united, and then you're we can fight in the tournament, and we'll train you, and then Wart, you'll be squire, mm-hmm. and then later on, Wart does some things, and finally, Hector's like, "That's it. You're not you're not going to be squire." And they give it to some unseen character who's never who's mentioned twice. Oh. Once when he's bec- when he becomes squire. Oh yeah. We're gonna make Hobbs his squire, and then yeah. later it's, he comes. He's got he, the mumps. <laughs> he's all puffed up like a toad. <laughs> yeah, he's never you seen. You can mimic him. every like, character in this movie uh, perfectly. It, it, Jesus it, Christ! It's a, it's a fun character. Yeah, like, so, it's, it's a fun like little uh, movie. To yeah. Mimic. So Merlin, knowing this information, mm. decides that he was gonna, he's going to teach Ward mm-hmm. how to the way of the world instead of just teaching him how to be a squire and how to take care of horses and yeah. put shields on knights. It's going to teach him how to be intelligent. Yeah, pa- making, knowledge is the power, not strength. Right. It's like there's more to him than just, you know, 
being a nothing squire yeah, just for a clean up for an committee. asshole. Yeah. <laughs> so and then begins a set of this. From this point on, the movie becomes very episodic. It's it's where yeah, it, it plays one sequence at a time, and something happens, and then goes it to black. It almost could have been cut in, into shorts. Like it pretty like, much, it could, it could have been, been like a series. A, yeah, like that would have been a great TV series. Just the adventures of. Merlin Wart. Yeah, and like the Transform- time in between um, the events of when yeah. they met and when- from early summertime to I guess yeah. Christmas time. And there could be other characters, like you know, uh, uh, a girlfriend. No, <laughs> which and is a-, a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, like the other knights, like uh, uh, Sir Lancelot and and all yeah. that. It's like, oh hey, here's Lancelot, and uh, he's. Oh, I'm nice and all, and I'm going to... Hey, Arthur, how's it going? Oh, are we going to be cars today? Is he Wendell from Emmett Otter's Jug Van Christmas? <laughs> Half of 50 cents. <laughs> Got any mashed potatoes? <laughs> potatoes are what we eat. <laughs> um, you want to I... fight? That's fighting words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and so now we get... Yeah, a... it, basically the... the um. Three parts of the movie onward are, are basically him, Merlin turning Wart into, Wart an, into an, animal an animal to teach him a lesson, which backfires in his face every time. Yeah, and and it's like I, I almost, <laughs> I almost want to like fight the logic of the this sort of, you know, the, the, this reasoning with Merlin of like how this would teach Wart. Right. More knowledge by making him a fish. Right, like I, that's the thing I want to know is because he's like he says like look at the fish they don't you know and then he says can you turn me into a fish he's like well I'm, sure and then he turns him into a fish <laughs> your fish now and then he teaches him how to swim like a fish mm-hmm. and then they they end up fighting this large I guess it's supposed to be like it looks like a barracuda but it's really like a pike yeah. some large prehistoric looking fish <laughs> and it's there's a whole thing and it's about brain that's brain over brawn but. I guess he's just outsmarting this fish by dodging him. I guess so. And then he doesn't. It doesn't end up working because he still. And even gets Archimedes chased. has to save him. You know, it's it's uh, it, it is kind of weird logic. Like I can understand what they were trying to come across. Yeah. With it. It's like if you are something else, you have to use your wits to kind of like like if you were a fish, how would you handle that situation? What would be your natural instinct to it? So. Obviously, it, yeah. Wart takes a while to learn that sort of lesson, and you know, two times already. It's like the second time he's turned into a squirrel, third times he's turned into a bird, and it it's it's really. But he's, it's it's weird. He's trying to teach him pretty much not the same lesson, but he teaches him when he's a squirrel. It's really just how to be a squirrel, and then once he just somehow meets this girl squirrel, it, it just it's becomes about, like a, it's a story about love. Yeah, and which is an unresolved. It's actually. It's sad. I mean, not, not to go really... ahead, but it's a very, it's a very not all. It, it it's not like oh they fall we, in love. We, we could go ahead with it, but yeah. it, it, there is no love story to this. It's one of the great. It's one of my favorite moments, and oddly in Disney, mm-hmm. is a moment where he says because they teach him about gra- earlier in the in that sequence. They teach gravity. you about gravity, mm-hmm. where gravity is something that causes you to fall down, and it's the it's a force that pulls you down. Mm-hmm. And then you get this love scene, and then you know. Uh, the squirrel falls in love with Wart, not knowing that he's a human because he's a squirrel. And mm-hmm. Merlin also has a problem with this really fat, ugly <laughs> squirrel. And they both go this <laughs> thing. And then the, the wolf comes back and nearly eats them. Mm-hmm. And then Merlin turns it back into a human. And, of course, the squirrel's really upset. And then he says, Merlin kind of, it comes full circle mm-hmm. at the end, which I think is really sweet how they plan that whole sequence. Yeah. Where he goes, you know, this love business is pretty... Powerful, powerful stuff. stuff. And he's like, greater than gravity. Oh yeah, I think it's probably the greatest force right, on right. earth. Which yeah, is very. It's and, and the, the way it's re- read, like the reading and the music and mm-hmm. the imagery. It's it's actually pretty and, nice. And then suddenly and the crying squirrel. Right. And then immediately the scene <laughs> after. Yeah. And then the scene right after that, just like in Bambi, where the mom dies, <laughs> you just yeah. hear like the sad music. Oh. And then you just hear. And it's the it's the scullery maid screaming because they oh yeah that's right before before the whole squirrel ordeal um, Wart was uh, cleaning up the kitchen which has God knows how many dishes are in that thing it's like, I don't know how many people live in this castle but if Hector and Kay use like seventy five dishes in a day if it was just them that was probably a year's worth of dishes that they they that Wart had to clean up. And Merlin comes in and is like, ah, have you ever been a squirrel? <laughs> Which is an odd thing to ask someone, but uh, 
But then the, it, it's continued on with like, okay, we're, we're going to go out and now I'm going to do the work for you. So he does his magic and does the flippity floppity floop and... Uh, Stops all the things. Yeah, and all the dishes start doing their own like cleaning. And yeah. it, it's, it's, it's a cool scene that where, where it's like a machine that's working itself. Yeah. A magic machine. Um, a magic... Yeah, but then they but then they go out and they're jumping across uh, trees as squirrels, and there is that scene with with the the girl squirrel. You know, it's really interesting. Um, I, I I really don't like to mention stuff on the side that much, but um, and I can't remember the artist, but I thought it was really neat that someone made an entire series about that squirrel turning into like a real girl and meeting up with Arthur and then there was like this whole like little comic about it That's and it was so cute. it was pretty it cute. cute. It was really cute. I wish I could find it again and I don't know who the artist is, oh, but well. I'll Maybe I'll, some, probably, yeah. I'll probably find it at some point. Yeah. But uh Oh yeah, so now that after two lessons, Wart is now demoted. He's not going to England with Kay yeah. as a squire. So, you know Yeah, because he keeps talking back to Sir Ector, Sir Ector yeah, because and, he's saying, you know, Merlin's a great wizard and he's teaching me a lot of and, stuff. And, it, and here's where you really notice it, the the voice of Arthur changing. Because oh, yeah. He, the, the actors who played, I think they had two separate kids playing Merlin. Mm. I mean, uh, Ward. <laughs> Ward. Two kids played Merlin. <laughs> two, Pretty, kids, two, two kids, kids in, in a, a suit, suit. <laughs> played Merlin. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they got through to Disney. Is like, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> you just, it, it just but, imagining. And, they, and for some reason, the kid just, just was voiced like Merlin, and I'm just yeah. thinking, <laughs> Jesus Christ, God, that was a horrible brain fart. Anyway, but anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, two kids, two kids ended up playing Arthur. I think they're the director Willie Ritherman's sons, mm-hmm. and one of them. That was weird. <laughs> I think it was that. But one... Uh, it's magnets. Yeah. Uh, one of them uh, voiced and then got older and went through puberty. Yeah. And then they got another kid, I think, to play him. And so there's technically, at different points of the movie, there's three voices in the movie. Yeah, because they still kept uh, the the voice change. Yeah. Because you'll notice, like, he, he has, like, that crack to his voice. Like, he's just going through puberty. It's like, he's a, he's a great wizard. <laughs> And then suddenly it's like, we were fine until we went into deep water. And why don't I make him sound like... Yeah, well, well, sometimes it's like you'll hear the, whoa, what? Whoa! Merlin! <laughs> and then it'll go into, like, the deep-voiced yeah, Arthur. <laughs> right. It's, there's no... I mean, they obviously recorded at different times. Yeah. Because they were like, oh, this scene's different. we got to have but a re record dialogue. It's, it's really noticeable sometimes. Yeah. So. so after that, Merlin's like, well, you got this, you're at your lowest point. You can only go up from here. So let me educate you. Yeah. Now is the time that yeah, since now, you have nothing to lose now, him. I'm going to, yeah. So he tries to teach him stuff and, you know, Archimedes keeps, yeah, cock, like, you know, pretty much yeah, blocking. Basically, well, logically, he's like, he states like, you're only confusing him. Because, you're teaching him about universe and stuff. You're getting way too ahead of him. Yeah. He's it's, gonna, people it, are going to think he's a it's lunatic. Like, and, as, it's as if someone from the future would come back into the past and try to explain an iPod yeah. to him. It's like, well, you see, it's like this device that you can hold in your hands. Like, a device? What is a device? Yeah. It's like, well, and, a device is something with a lot of mechanisms yeah. in it. Oh, like a clock. No, well, kind of, but it's like... You know. Yeah, and then so Archimedes kind of just calls Merlin out, and Merlin's like, all right, he's your pupil, <laughs> and says, you could go and teach because, this yeah, sort of be, shit. Yeah, yeah, so... And then, and then we get to the point where Archimedes, and I love Archimedes because he's so flustered, and and Archimedes is voiced by a guy named Julius Matthews, mm. who um, he did Rabbit. He was Rabbit and Winnie the Pooh. Yep, and um, it's a great voice. He, about it, not too long, like within ten years after this, he had a pretty massive stroke, mm. which is really sad. But yeah. His voice is so like he does that perfect like what 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 <laughs> who you know, like it's it's so it's like it's when you think about it, it's the perfect voice for an owl. Yeah, he's got he's probably one of the. I mean, I'm gonna. It sounds weird to say, but he's probably the He's my favorite of all the Disney owls, <laughs> which there are a lot of Disney owls. You know what? There are. There are. There's the owl from Bambi. There's the Winnie the Pooh owl. There's the Fox and the Hound owl. There's this owl. There's the Sleepy Beauty owl. Holy crap. There's all these fucking owls. owls. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, there. Yeah, so Archimedes is probably my favorite, and because he, he's so, he's, he's his personality is perfect, and he's a great, yeah, and he, he has great like chemistry a, between him and he War- has like a small voice, but at the same time, it's very sophisticated sounding. Yeah, and it's yeah, it, it's a very fitting, yeah, very fitting and voice. He, he tries to teach Wart the ABCs, and <laughs> because he can't read, right? So. And then somehow. Oh, Merlin is looking for his his plane model. And he, <laughs> oh, Archimedes, do you want to see that uh, flying contraption? The model. Model. <laughs> it's only a model. <laughs> but yeah, and then he tries to sh- prove, and it goes into the water, and it's probably one of the funniest scenes in the movie, mm-hmm. is he gets caught in his beard and goes down. <laughs> yeah, because he's winding it, and as you see him winding this It's going beard. into his beard, <laughs> and then it, go- it ends up just going straight down and crashing, and... <laughs> Archimedes is laughing, and it's really well animated, but it's so well acted. I, I imagine, like, you know, Matthews probably was in the booth and just did it too much, and, like, this is gold. We have to use all of this. <laughs> and it's this part where he, like, catches his breath and looks... My favorite part is when he he's laughing, and then he just goes... <clears throat> and looks over the side back at the, at the model, and he yeah. starts laughing. It's great. It's, yeah, it sounds like a bird... And then at that point, it it that's the kind of sets the ball rolling to mm-hmm. let's teach uh, y- yeah. Merlin uh, teach Ward how to be a bird because mm-hmm. okay. he because he's interested in flying. He's like I've always dreamed of flying, and so just, I'm a bird. I'm a bird. I'm a bird. <laughs> and then and then around. you know Archimedes says I'm a bird. You know I'll I'm, teach him. I'll teach him. It's not a mechanical process. <laughs> so then Archimedes teaches him how to fly. And the weird thing about this scene is that I could tell that they probably in an odd way like exp- like. Mat, animated it with a mat because the characters really stand out. They almost pop against the BG. Yeah. With the yeah. moving BG because there's almost like a white line around it. It looks really like they definitely had a different process on it. Yeah. And it didn't look right. But it, they teach him how to fly and then a hawk comes out of nowhere and chases uh, Wart into the forest where they meet. And this is the, the most iconic sequence. portion of the, the entire movie. Yeah, this is what most people, when they think of this movie, they think of, oh man, Mim. Yeah. So great, and this, so there's Madame Mim, and she's like in a in a in a cottage in the middle of the dark forest. Yeah, she looks like a relative. She looks like one she of looks my like relatives. a relative. She looks like one of my relatives. <laughs> and the first line is perfect. Yeah. to introduce this character, she's playing Sounds solitaire like, by. <laughs> yeah, she's playing solitaire by herself. Sounds like someone's sick. Ooh, how delightful! <laughs> I hope it's something serious, yeah. something <laughs> dreadful. <laughs> And then just, um, and then of course you know, it's like, it's like an old baddie lady in the, yeah. in the house, and she has her window open. She hears someone coughing outside and says, "Like, oh, that's music to my oh, ears." It's just like, oh, I just don't, I don't know why, but it reminded me of Thumbelina, uh, not Thumbelina, uh, Patrol in Central Park. Oh God, it's a baby oh. crying. Oh. <laughs> why? Why did you have to compare? You're not gonna be able to Good Lord, it. God. <laughs> Fucking God. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I know. But um so then, you know, uh Wart introduced himself and says, Oh, I was changed by a, into a bird because I'm actually a boy. I was changed by Merlin. And she's like, Oh, Merlin, <laughs> you know. And then she sings a really fun little song. Yeah. It's a, it's the most memorable song in the in the movie. The Mad Madame Mim song. Yeah. Yeah, and she, you know, she proves to him that because she could do a lot of tricks and stuff, and it's a fun little marvelous boy, marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm bad, marvelous, marvelous. <laughs> and then she turns herself into a pig and yeah. uh, a beautiful, sexy, silvery voice, long purple hair. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen so much. I have to. I will say, I've seen so much smut. Of this, of this sexy mim, oh, yeah. but she only appears on screen for a and, total and of about ten seconds. Yeah, yeah, and I, I can tell you off, off the top of my head, I know who you're talking about yeah. because I've seen I'm the artist. I know the artist. Freak. I'm an ugly. Old <laughs> and so, yeah. and so, then she realized that, like, you know, Wart's like, well, Merlin's magic's kind of, you know, Good. useful. Yeah, <laughs> and your magic's kind of like. Yes, yeah. in my book, that's bad. Yeah, and he's like, oh, and then she's like, I'm afraid I'm going to have to destroy you. And so she tries to, it turns into a cat and is all, I love, one of my, she's one of my favorites. She's so- her acting, her delivery is so great because there's a moment where she's a cat and she's chasing, ah! and she, she goes, I win, oh, the game's over. <laughs> <laughs> what I, she's like what I love, what I love about this character is that she's, 
she's from the ye old times of London, but she sounds like a southern hick. Yeah. You know, she's like, <laughs> and the- or what is the line where she's like, she's a tiger, like, watch me, will you? <laughs> I love, um, it's funny because uh, Mim, apparently, I didn't know this until about a year or so ago, Mim was such a popular character that in Europe, mm. they used her a lot in the comics. Like, she interacted with, like, Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse because oh. she was such a popular character. Yeah. And I, she's a great character. I love her character. She's in games a lot, actually. Yeah. A lot of the and, Disney games. Yeah, and she's really cool. And then so... She's about to kill... She's a memorable York. character. Yeah. She's not necessarily a villain, but she's one of those, you know so bad she's good yeah i mean and so merlin comes and saves wart and they challenge each other to a wizard's duel yeah and just in time and there's some great like setup where there's like oh we have rules here you know you have to be an animal you can't be make-believe things like pink dragons and stuff mm-hmm. and no disappearing and of course the, the, <laughs> rule the duel, four no cheating, cheating. <laughs> and then of course she immediately cheats on every <laughs> yeah. count and then what what happens for the next like three or four minutes is a great what probably the yeah it's the best sequence in the movie this is, is the this wizard's that they, duel scene this is the sequence that they would show all the time on disney channel i had actually had an eight millimeter version someone my oh, dad wow. my dad found an eight millimeter projector mm. and a little moviola yeah and he got me when i was a kid a bunch of these um a bunch of disney cartoons they were silent because they were eight millimeter but i could put them through and i could go because he knew i like to go frame by frame mm. So I could actually go through and watch the wizard wow. stool one, but it was under a camera. And I That's had to awesome. unscroll it. Yeah. I still have it back in New York. I wish I had it because huh. I totally get a bunch. That'd be of cool to see. Film. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's really the animators and the board art. Uh, Bill oh, they Pete, must have yeah, had a ball. With yeah, this. had a great. Must have had a great time. Yeah. One of the one of the biggest things about this movie is just turning these people into animals. It's fun seeing, like, how do you translate a character like Merlin into a mouse or a crab? Or, or a, a walrus. Or a walrus. It's perfect because he's got this big mustache. Yeah. And the thing is, it's, cut. you know, Mim is pink and mm-hmm. or purple. and It's it's almost uh, like what animals would best represent this character? And at the same time, it's like, how would this character represent right. this animal? Like, you could tell, like, if you, if you saw a picture of Merlin and Wart and then you saw the, like... The Merlin fish and yeah. wart fish are perfect. Yeah. The bird wart is perfect. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, you know, yeah, when, they, he's a, they when there's squirrels and stuff, it's it's really well designed because you're thinking about adapting a human character into a animal's form mm-hmm. and trying to retain the character and the personality, just even in the design. Yeah. If you saw a still image of just the animal version of Merlin, as say, like he's at one point he's a goat, it's perfect because he's got the beard yeah. he's got the gla- and he still has the glasses and everything. Mm-hmm. It's really cool, and you get these really great back and forths where you see, okay, he's a small animal, and M- M- Mim's bigger, so he turns into an even bigger animal, but mm-hmm. then turns into a smaller animal. Really great back and forth, and each one kind of gets the upper hand of another one point at a time. Yeah. And then finally, Mim, after all this... Yeah. Oh, there's a point where we always laugh at this. There's a point where... Um, it's a great moment, because there's a uh, it's a character's tail under... Oh, um, Mim turns into a cat, oh. tries to smash... Uh, uh, oh, Mouse Merlin. Yeah. Oh, there, there's a, there's a part. Yeah, yeah. And it's a great transition where he's about to bite the tail, and then you see that a rat, a, a rattlesnake, ta- uh, the rattler of a rattlesnake appears, mm-hmm. and she goes, ah, 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 Merlin. She and he, she bites, lunges at him, and actually bites his head. She goes, ouch, whoa. <laughs> and every time, <laughs> yeah, that's so every, crazy. That, that, like, whoa. <laughs> She, and then she curls up because she's like, because yeah. she bit her tail. And she's like, oh. That, for some reason, that's such a great moment. It's the reading. The, yeah. The reading is brilliant. It's the reading and the way it looks afterwards because the snake is all scrunched up. It's like, it's like if a human would just go like, like was hit in the stomach. She looks like a scrunchie. And you would go like, oh. <laughs> yeah. She looks, she looks like a scrunchie. Yeah. A snake scrunchie. It's fantastic. And so it, they fi- it, it has to be seen. I'm sure the clip is somewhere. It's on YouTube. It, if for you don't sure. want to see the whole movie, I suggest just, just watching, watching the wizard stool scene. Yeah. And then you know, um, she turn ends up once when you think Merlin's won, she turns into a dragon, mm-hmm. and it's the pink dragon, or no, she it's like no pink dragon. She said no pink dragon, so she turns yeah. into a purple dragon, and chases after Merlin, and nearly you know you think she's got Merlin, but yeah. Merlin turns into a germ. Mm-hmm. And it makes her, inf- and it's so great that she, she a great little moment where she's tar- getting in spots and sneezing and <laughs> getting cold. And then it's, who I, f- I forget who was the voice of Mim. 
Oh, uh, but she she did a bunch of Disney roles as well outside of Mim. Martha Wentworth. Yeah, I think she also plays the uh, the girl, the the, the old lady squirrel. Mm. And yeah. when she screams and yells, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. she does some great lines. Just the she like, does great screams. You sneaky old scout! And she's just like <laughs> yelling. I hate sunshine. Oh yeah, when he puts her to bed and she's like lots of sunshine, and then you just hear her screaming bloody murdy. <laughs> I hate. <laughs> just like the door shut, you just hear muffled screaming. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, that delivery is brilliant. And then after that, you kind of beca- you get into like the final little act of the movie, mm-hmm. which is Hobbs gets this guy Hobbs gets sick. So, <laughs> yeah. so Hobbs some, who we've never met. Yeah, and so <laughs> Ward becomes squire, goes up and tells Merlin, "Oh, I'm a squire," and Merlin's pissed. Yeah, he's he's he, like, "I I thought I taught you better," mm-hmm. and he I blows thought you up. would amount to something. Yeah. Um. A and great future boy. Very sarcastic. Great future. The first sarcastic moment in a Disney movie. Yeah. Oh, great job, you asshole. Yeah, and this kind of... It, <laughs> I almost want to say this is very abrupt. This entire moment that yeah. this happened. What do you want me to be? Yeah. I'm nobody. And then he just like... like what did I, we went through a whole fucking movie. Yeah. A whole summer and shit. I mm-hmm. think you're special and you don't think that suddenly you back at... Blow me to Bermuda. <laughs> yeah. And he goes flying off. Yeah, and he just rockets off. Yeah, and, and I love, he's like, "Where's it going?" It's like Bermuda. <laughs> yeah, I love. I love how because because for the, most of the movie, Archimedes he's, Archimedes acting is so broad. Mm-hmm. So this, it's great to see him down. Where he's just like, and you could tell he's really just sort of yeah. sad and disappointed. Just to Bermuda. Oh, some island that has. Yeah, been yeah and and also like to another point where it's like Archimedes is also a little bit more sympathetic to Wart. Yeah, at it, that point he's he's grown to like because even when it's great acting. I th- who whoever I think it was Ollie Johnson, but whoever animated Archimedes mm. in this movie sp- specifically, I think it was him. Yeah. There's a scene where even where when Wart comes in and says, "I'm a squire," you see Archimedes look at Wart, but look at Arthur. I mean, look at Merlin, mm-hmm. and he's trying to be like, "Oh, that's," uh, and he looks at oh, Merlin, "Oh, very, very nice, nice boy. boy," but he knows that yeah. Merlin's not gonna be happy. It's great little acting where he darts his eyes and knows that Merlin's yeah. gonna lose his shit, mm-hmm. and. It was, it's a great scene, and then we get to England, and there's a tournament, and Wart jousting, yeah, and Wart forgets case. So forgot my sword. You know what? It, and this is just a, a little thing from me, um, because okay, Arthur forgot uh, Kay's sword, which he needs to fight, and Arthur's like, oh no, the sword, I forgot it, and he goes, okay, he's like, I forgot your sword, and then he go, and then Kay look goes over to him, he's like. Forgot my sword, and for the longest time, I thought Kay said, "I got my sword," oh. because it sounds like I got my sword. <laughs> like, like, wait. Oh, you do have he your sword. He has a sword. Then why is he pissed off? Yeah. And and it didn't really dawn on me that he was saying, "Forgot yeah. my sword." <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, he goes back, but the inn's closed because they're all at the tournament watching, yeah. and then he sees. Back full circle again, mm-hmm. the sword and the stone, the which is actually sword. very. It doesn't have vines or anything on it. It's actually very well yeah, kept. Yeah, it's very well kept. They, in this they little dusted, churchyard. They dusted. Yeah, everywhere. and so he, you know, of course the, you know, every Comes time over. he goes near it, the little, <laughs> you know, and then he takes the sword back, and everyone's like, "Wait a minute, this is the sword and the stone. How did you get this thing? Oh, I pulled it out." Yeah. Bullshit. We're gonna go back and make sure. Yeah. Oh, you're lying. oh. What's what's the great the Black Knight guy? The, the, the... Thurl Ravenscroft Knight. Yes, Thurl Ravenscroft. Yeah. And Tony the Tiger. I like. I love that character. Hold on, that's not fair. <laughs> I say we let <laughs> the, the boy sword try. and the stone. I wish I could do be. his voice. It's the amazing. sword and the stone. It can't be. <laughs> it's just. It's such a deep, re- it's yeah. resonating voice, and when he yells out and everything, it's so great. Yeah, and then so he- they they go back to where the sword and the stone was, and they put it in, and are like they're trying to say like, all right, prove it, like that you took it out, and then Kay like immediately pushes aside, it's like everybody knows that you know you can, you can easily it. pull it out once it's been pulled and it's yeah. it's stuck yeah it's stuck and again. then then the, there's tons of people that come over and they're trying to, to pull it. it's like hey go on, that's not fair <laughs> yeah and so the, he pulls it out and proves that he's that he pulled it out yeah. and he's king yeah it, it's like there's that magical moment that yeah it's like okay the, he was chosen as the king now. right and then and they, everyone immediately just goes like hail king arthur mm-hmm. long live the king and now he's like on the throne and I love that he's like, I don't know anything about ruling a country. <laughs> yes. I mean, he's with Archimedes, too. It's like, 
I told you to leave it in the stone, you bastard. You idiot. You idiot. And then he tries to get out and he can't. And then he calls with his high pitched, oh. prepubescent voice, Merlin. Merlin. And he comes back with sunglasses. And he basically. Is I love. What, I love the joke he makes about 20th century life. <laughs> yeah. I'm back in from the 21st, and believe me, you can have it. <laughs> One big modern mess. <laughs> Which is so fucking true. Yeah, he's wearing all like all the outfit the genie wore at the end of Yeah, pretty the much. <laughs> yeah, and so he, you know, and, you know, Merlin says, oh, congrats, you're, the, you're king, Ar- of course, you're King Arthur. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you'll be a star, and you'll even have a motion picture named after you. <laughs> motion picture. Yeah. And it's it's weird that when you think about it, the last line of that movie is it's kind of like television without commercials, right? And that's like a, some, yeah, so it's like oh you'll even have a round table. It's like round table. Oh, would you oh, rather yeah. have a square one? <laughs> oh, yeah. round would be fun. I mean, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, honestly, it's like it's honestly a really abrupt end. Yeah, I'm not um, a huge fan of the ending, but it. it w- <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know where it could go from there. I, I, I feel like there was a huge disconnect when Merlin leaves and to where he comes back. It's like, it, it just seems coincidental or, or just like, this was all planned out. You know, it's like, I just came back anyway, and now I'm going to teach you again. Yeah. And there's really, there really isn't any resolve to it. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of brings me to the whole point of the entire movie. It's a great character piece. it's it's yeah that's what it is it's really like the thing that makes it interesting as a movie is the character interaction yeah. which to me that's what i love the most about watching a movie mm-hmm. is seeing how the characters the, their personality and how they they and, interact and the chemistry between those characters and and this movie doesn't really have a, a beginning middle and end in the traditional sense it's episodic it's very much like alice in wonderland or yeah other episodic movies where a character goes from one place to another or deals with yeah. one thing. And they're blackout gags where literally the screen fades to black. Mm-hmm. Time has passed. Now here's another lesson. Yeah, yeah. You know. And which is, it doesn't necessarily make the movie bad. It's just like, it's very unconventional. For um, a Disney movie, it's very unconventional. I mean. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah all, all things considered. But yeah, it, it's, I, I honestly really, I appreciate it because of the fact that the characters are fantastically animated as well as acted. And it's just fun seeing really cartoony, caricaturized, stylized human characters. It's like watching The Incredibles, where you're like, this is a good movie and the characters are great, but they're caricatured humans and they're done yeah. really well. Yeah, yeah. And and it's it's great to see them, how they interact, how they work, how they how they kind of like you know, interact with each other. And there's great moments where, you know, like especially yeah. with Madame Mim and Merlin or with Arthur, yeah. you know, when, when they're going back and forth with stuff, it's just, it's fun little, it's a fun little vignette. Right. And also I noticed that it's a very, I didn't realize until, I mean, as a kid, you don't really realize it, but as I got older, very male dominated. Yeah, it is. Except there, for that, yeah. There's, there's a scullery maid. And, and Madame Mim. And Madame, well, technically, yeah, Madame Mim, but yeah, they're all, Except for the the girl squirrel, yeah, that's... very ugly, kind of like almost they're like Monty Python men in drag <laughs> levels of, of female character. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's kind of like wow, I didn't realize. But how... uh, but at the same time, it's like it's kind of cool that there aren't right. Like... Well, the thing is, it's, it's a story it, it... about an old man and this boy in teaching this boy. Yeah. Rather than it's not about you know. It, it would have I. I hate to say it, but it would have kind of bogged it down if there was like a love interest element to yeah. it. Because it's, uh, because it's like, not really the focus of the story. It's I almost about him feel like, king. yeah, I almost feel like if if it were if it were made today, there would be that element in there, and you know, it, and maybe the girl would be very proactive, like she was better than Ward or something, and then you know, it, it, the whole like what the hiccup and. Uh, What's Astrid. Her face? Astrid. Astrid, yeah. The whole, that whole element of it. <laughs> yeah. Which really isn't the, like in this movie, the point is just, this is the story of king, how King Arthur became King Arthur. Mm-hmm. It's a story about how Merlin and Archimedes yeah. teach this boy how to be king. Yeah. And while it, it could have been a little bit more interesting, like there could have been a little bit more, um, I, I don't want to say like there was, there shouldn't be. You know, some some sort of element where it's like you know time is running out or something. Yeah. But this this just kind of like it just, moves along. It just drifts. It like you're almost just kind of like being pulled along by this movie. Yeah. It's, it's not. It's it doesn't engage you. It's like you're a fly on the wall at the time right. when all this stuff happens. But also, I mean, like so. there's certain movies, like even look at the movies that came around that time, like definitely with uh, 
Jungle Book, but mm. to some extent with Dalmatians and definitely with Robin Hood, mm. where you don't feel like the movie is el- like escalating. Yeah. There's never a moment where the movie goes on a specific tack and then you hit a climax yeah. and then go down. Right. It's more like, here's a bunch of events you're kind of just wafting through. Up, oh, we're at the end of the movie. Yeah, but... Jungle it, Book is very much like that, except it does kind of go up, and then suddenly he's at the man village. Yeah. Same with Robin Hood, where it's like, oh, he's got to save Maid Marian, but it's not really... It's only in the last third of the movie where he's like, oh, we got to steal these... We got to save all these people down up. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, it's just, here's some... Yeah, there's of, things that are in, at stake, you know? It, yeah. It, it's like... But uh, with Sword in the Stone, it's like, there really is no element where you feel like... You know why? Why are we? Why are we finding this so important? You know, like, I mean, why, we like why... the characters enough that we want to stick around and watch them do something. Yeah, but yeah, but that's that's why it's not so much like a very. It's not a traditional sense of storytelling. It's it's very. Uh, it, I I'm. It's against storybooky. You know, it, it, yeah. Where it's like, okay, here's the villain. Here's what's at stake. Here's what the characters have to do in order to fix that, and then we get the climax, which is you know everyone lives happily ever after. This one is like, it kind of ends at a cliffhanger almost. Like, where, well, now he's king. Now it's almost like yeah. Now wish what? You, now you want to see more? Yeah. You know, and I almost feel like yeah, it would be neat to see a continuation of that. Right. It, it, you know, in a sense where it's like, well, he would meet other characters and stuff like that. How would he become a a, a, would, ju- a very just and noble king. Yeah. Which, of course, you know, I mean... And the thing about it, this movie won out. There was a... I, a the story is so odd. There was... Disney used to have sort of a... They did it definitely in the 80s and the 90s, but they back in the day, they had sort of a gong show mm. where they didn't know what the movie they wanted to do. Yeah. And Disney's like, well, you guys... You took a team over there. You got a few months to develop your movie, and you te- guys have the time to develop your movie. Mm-hmm. So... You know, some of the big guys were over here, and they were developing Sword in the Stone. Mm-hmm. And then over there, they were developing Chanticleer, which is the one that everybody oh, wanted to do yeah. because everybody missed animating the characters like they did in uh, uh, Song of the South. They wanted to animate more Song of the South like characters. Yeah. Again. So they developed the Chanticleer movie, which is Reynard Chanticleer, and mm-hmm. you know, the, you know, the, the, he Chanticleer's for himself, and they thinks that the sun rises when he crows and all this stuff. And then they. They had a meeting they, after months and months and months and months of developing each movie. The people who pitched Chanticleer, uh, Walt had a bunch of, you know, early, it's like early equivalent of an executive with him. And they says, how can you make a chicken a likable character? And then for some reason, Walt was like, I guess he's right. I mean, how? I guess we'll go with that one. And they ended up choosing Sword in the Stone. So whoever and everybody, that asshole And was. everybody was fucking disappointed because uh, they all wanted to work on Chanticleer. Yeah. And they weren't too enthusiastic about Sword in the Stone. And then all half of these guys went on to Sword in the Stone, like Milk Call and the others. And some of them were just like, fucking, I'm leaving animation. Yeah, it's almost like they... they I, I feel like the animal element to Sword in the Stone was almost kind of brought yeah. into it because of the whole show. Yeah, I think Disney should have made Chanticleer, but then eventually Don Bluth went in and fucked it up. Yeah, but, you know... Who, eventually, though, I mean, the thing is it's odd when Disney touches a movie you can never ever touch that story again unless it's directed video <laughs> or like or yeah or it's a, uh, or it's a story like say like but Christmas I mean, story but, but then like but there's imagine like, there, there's tons of like you know Tarzan movies there's tons of Jungle yeah, but when Book people, movies but when, today is when people think of Tarzan mm-hmm. they think of the Disney Tarzan yeah. just like when people mention Cinderella you think of the Disney Cinderella yeah, or the exactly. Disney Alice in Wonderland yeah uh, except for maybe stories like A Christmas Carol or Jack and the Beanstalk, most people don't think of automatically of the Mickey version, or mm. they don't think of the Mickey Christmas Carol. Yeah. But anyway, b- back to um, which is another odd, uh, weird connection. Now that I say it, when they originally were doing Mickey's Christmas Carol, it was based on a record, mm. uh, a record, and originally instead of Jiminy Cricket, um, uh, instead of there being the Willie the uh, Willie the Giant was Willy still in the it, giant. but instead of Jiminy Cricket. Mm-hmm. And Pete as the Ghost of Christmas Future, it was Merlin as the Ghost of Christmas Past, yeah. and the Witch from Snow White as the f- Future, <laughs> which would have been weird. But then they realized those characters, especially Merlin, because it's a Xerox '60s era character yeah. next to a '40s style Mickey Mouse character or <laughs> Wind in the Willows yeah, character. Yeah, that would, yeah it's, so they changed it's it to Jiminy because that... Jiminy's a much better fit to that universe than yeah. the others. So uh, overall, um, Sword in the Stone is a great piece to watch. It's, it's definitely um, not the best Disney movie, but it's a movie that. 
it's one of my favorites because I'm very fond of it because I like the characters a lot, especially Archimedes. I'm fond of it just because Merlin. the character interactions are just so fun to watch. And they're gen- they feel oddly genuine. Yeah. And they look fun. And and it's like, I love it when they uh, stylize human characters and just have fun with them. You know, it's like they look like they were just having a ball drawing these characters. Unlike Pocahontas, where everyone looks like they suffered. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, where where you have to have those moments where they're just breathing and, you know. But uh, yeah, no, Sword in the Stone, um, like we said, please avoid the Blu ray. Get to see if you can find the early copy of uh, a DVD. Um, because, uh, yeah, you, you need to experience it through that, those sort of eyes, the, like, like, not, not the, the, not the filtered eyes, the, uh, original, sh- uh, scratchy record sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so, um, that was our review of Sword in the Stone. Hope you yeah. enjoyed. Uh, I will also mention that, uh, we are on Patreon. You can look us up. We are on patreon.com backslash Andrew Dickman. That's my name. And, uh, I'm sorry, Mike. Uh, all right. <laughs> if you would like, you could please donate to our Patreon and, uh, for the, for the special tiers that you can get, uh, podcasts, like special podcasts of us do- making discussions a month in advance, um, and, uh, we'll send that over to you whenever there's a payment that's gone through. And, uh, the, then after a month, we'll post that over, um, on our regular podcast area on Podbean. And, uh, also we are on Facebook. That is the best place that you can contact us or give us suggestions or discuss the, the movie that we have discussed. Um, that's facebook.com backslash animated anarchy cast and uh we'll post there and uh, you can also just leave us messages and uh you know just say what you'd like to say and talk about tunes and uh we are also on twitter mike i'm at a guy who draws and i am at awd twit and uh yeah i guess that's it so um and Thank you so much for enjoying this podcast. We will be back next time, hopefully not too long. <laughs> too, not, there, there might be a little bit of a bubble between uh, podcast episodes, but uh, we'll we'll try to keep it consistent so uh, you can enjoy your, and listen to your heart's content. So anyway, thank you so much for enjoying. Uh, this has been Animated Anarchy. I'm Andrew Dickman, and that miracle <laughs> appeared. <laughs> In London town, the sword in the stone. So, <laughs> bye everyone. So long. In the land of the sword and stone, and I don't know the lyrics. Who put it in there in the first place? Who put the thing in, in the thing that they did? Did you imagine if it was the like a, if, if, if the sword and stone was a Mad Lib? I don't know. A blank is sung <laughs> of when was <laughs> and were and. And the good the had had leprosy. <laughs> <laughs>